Our next speaker is John Redoff. John is a, currently the CEO of Disruptor Beam, which is a social game company that works with branded IP. John's creden John has spent about 15 years preparing for this particular talk. He was uh, he was one of the uh, the heads of one of the first internet ga uh, gaming publishers, Gamer DNA, and then he spent many he spent quite a few years in the enterprise world. Uh, with, with ePrize, a web software company they took public on the NASDAQ. What he's going to speak about today is gameplay motivations, and he is going to give you, the, the focus will be to describe how to create long-term engagement. So that we, so just to give you a preview of what his position is, you should see his uh, blog post on radoff.com, which says the behavioral through my whole life to understand what it is that makes people do what they do. So uh, Gabe took a few polls, so I'll take a quick poll. Who here loves, well, actually love is too strong a word. Who here likes slot machines? Don't be shy. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we like them. Okay, who loves slot machines? Like you can't wait to get back to the casino just to play a slot machine. All right, that's good. Statistically, that's accurate. There's a couple of people that should, in this audience, find slot machines to be the most compelling thing you can imagine. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, because slot machines do describe a certain kind of behavioral loop. Um, but it's not the only one that moderates human behavior. And I'm going to talk about all the other ways that people are motivated and what it is about games, what, it, what games actually say about human behavior, and how you can use this knowledge to craft experiences that will completely change the way you interact with your customers. So I want to start with a guy named B.F. Skinner. This is a picture from the 50s. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a psychologist who did a really important thing for the world of psychology. What he did is he took it from the world of Freudian and Jungian mumbo jumbo, all this pre-scientific, pseudo-scientific nonsense, and he turned it into a science. He looked at behavior as something that could actually be studied. That's really good. But what he did is he went too far. He looked at behavior as being something that you could reduce down to one particular thing, and that's the idea that people have only one instinct, and that's to learn, and that when you give them learning experiences, you can completely control their behavior. Um, his favorite lab animal was actually a pigeon, but these days in what's called the operant conditioning chamber, or more popularly, the Skinner box, people use rats. And in fact, game designers often think of people as rats in a cage, that if you can push a pleasure button, and do it enough times, you can change behavior. And in fact, that type of pleasure button, that behavioral loop, that does have an effect on people's behavior, but it's really a small piece of it. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. Because if you really want to have a big impact, if you want to engage people over the long term, if you want to create a high ROI because you have influenced people in a way that forms relationships with them, you have to understand a hell of a lot more than just the rat in a cage Skinner box formulation. So why is that? It's because we come from different ecosystems. This is the ecosystem of a rat living in nature. We're different than that. We're also even different than cute monkeys with their, with their tools, and all mammals like to play. But humans have a much different environment for a number of reasons. One is that this is actually the human environment. These are the tools that we use. These are the places that we go. No other animal is like that. And there's reasons for that. One is that our niche is not just the natural world. Our niche is also the world of ideas, thoughts, experiments, stories, language. It's the cognitive niche. That's where humans exist. The other half of it is that we're social animals. And yes, there are other social animals, but no other organism has done what humans have. We've built cities. We've built social networks. We've created Facebook. We've created social games. We've done a lot of things that are continuously building upon the social interactions that human beings have. 
So this combination of the social niche and the cognitive niche that we live in is absolutely essential to understanding what it is that makes the great gaming experiences work. So when we connect with each other, we're not just forming social connections, we're creating neural connections. And one of the really interesting pieces of research around this was a study that was done recently that looked at what happens when you look at people's Facebook avatars. And what they found is that people who were smiling in their Facebook avatar picture were more likely to be clustered with other people who were smiling. People who were frowning or not smiling, they were also clustered together. So this is really interesting. It's showing that socially, people congregate together and have a massive influence on each other. So if you want to look at the very basic example of a social proof, look at your own Facebook avatar picture, look at whether you're smiling or not, and then look at your circle of friends. And statistically, most people you're connected to will be either smiling or not smiling, similar to yourself. Why is this important, and why is this going to be important for games? It's because games are experiences, and one of the really interesting pieces of economic research that's happened over the last few years is the idea that experiences are really what make people happy. A game is essentially an experience. What is an experience? An experience is something that is largely extant within your memory. Okay? It's something that transforms you, something that you take away that's not physical, and experiences make people happy. If you can craft experiences, that's what really reshapes your relationship with people. So games have been around for a long time. This is a chart that I put up on my website, tracing back the history of games back to about 5,000 years. That's about as far as the archaeological record goes back for games. No doubt there were games even further back than that. Because if we look at some of the primitive cultures that still exist on the Earth, we can find that they've got games. For example, this Marngruk ball, which is a, which is a ball game played by uh, Aboriginal people in Australia. This is a ball made of kangaroo fur or something nasty like that. But um, it actually you know, gives you a sense of how long games, sports, things like that have been around. Likewise, some games have persisted over an extremely long period of time. So the oldest backgammon board is from about 5,000 years ago. It was found in Iran. This is one from ancient Rome about 2,000 years ago. This is a tapestry showing a backgammon board in, you know, around six or 700 years ago. Of course, this is the backgammon board we've got today. It hasn't really changed that much, and there's a reason why games have persisted over time for as long as they have. So games hit a lot more than the, dopam the uh, dopaminergic systems within your brain. So there's a part of your brain called the ventral tegmental area, which is a piece of the brain stem which is involved in pleasure sensation. And it's very, very important in human behavior, everything from eating to casino games to you know, sex, you name it. It's very, very important. However, there's a lot more going on in games than the dopamine systems. For example, social behaviors are not mostly driven by dopamine. They're actually driven by serotonin. So there's a lot more going on there. And this is actually some fMRI brain scans showing how much of the brain lights up while people are playing games. So I think that this should give you a sense of just how much you can bring to a game experience and how much that you need to be thinking about to create a truly immersive, long-term, engaging game experience. So we've talked about Bartle a little bit. Um, I think that Bartle, just like B.F. Skinner's kind of description of behaviorism, is one of these mimetic viruses that has invaded an awful lot of places that it really doesn't belong. And there's problems with this. And Bartle himself would admit or agree that um, it's not intended to be adapted all over the place. So for example, thinking of people as socializers, as one particular box of behavior, that's not a box of behavior. We're always social. Socialization is something that runs across everything we do. So when you're achieving something, you're learning something, you're participating, you're collaborating, all of those are social. So I think when Gabe makes the point that there's a social layer that, that layers on top of that, be that behavioral component, that's actually the more accurate way to look at it, which is that socialization is everywhere. And the killer component, or what you know, Barl actually originally introduced as griefers, he looked at it as people that sort of wanted to torture other players playing the game, kind of exploit game mechanics. 
This has kind of been co-opted to mean competitive behaviors and people who just want to win and dominate other players. It wasn't actually what he meant by it. It was more like an abusive player. So there's a lot of problems in this model, which is why I think it needs a lot of rethinking at this point. So to rethink it, I think you have to look at the time frame of what affects behaviors. So if you look at the types of things that control what it is that you do, that dopaminergic loop, that thing that controls pleasure sensations and behaviors in the short term, it's something that happens in a very short span of time. That's why the vast majority of you are not going back and playing slot machines all the time. Slot machines are fun while you're doing them, but they don't get you to go back and play slot machines over and over again, especially the same type of slot machine over and over again. The more successful slot machines that are out there right now are ones like the Sex in the City slot machine, which isn't just about winning coins. It's got an avatar system. It's got virtual goods. It's actually got a story. So they're starting to even bring into the slot machine universe some of these components that have been important in other types of games. To really figure out what affects behavior, you have to go all the way back to evolution. You have to understand what it is that moderates behavior and regulates what it is that we do. And if you go back to deep evolutionary time, you find a lot of other types of behaviors. This is the way I like to look at the schema of interactions and behaviors that are important to us as human beings. Okay? Achievement, which is about mastering skills. Cooperation, which is working together to build cities, to build software, to build corporations. Competition, because we like to look to who the leaders amongst us are, we like to understand who are the people who we should try to emulate, okay? And immersion, which is really important. Because you could look at all the games we've described, like, let's just take a simple one like Farmville that everyone's probably familiar with. You could strip away the whole story of Farmville. You could make Farmville just a game about increasing um, points on a grid and taking tiles on and off and completely take away the story, that would not be a fun game. Farmville is fun because it's got nurturing, because it's got growing, because it's got plants, because it's a farm, because there's a story that's actually present there. And unless you combine it with that story, you're not going to get that longer term type of engagement with a player that's so essential. So I'm just going to recap these four categories to give you food for thought, because I think these are the motivations that I think you want to think of holistically when describing a game experience. So immersion. Immersion is, starts with storytelling. It's about experiences. It's about allowing a player, who is a human being, to relate with the experience, to create the symbols in their mind that makes it accessible and meaningful to them. All good games in the entertainment business have some amount of immersion in them. Even games that are fairly abstract, like Tetris, there is a certain immersion, whether it's through the art or just the experience of play, that's essential. So you need to be thinking about, who is my customer? What is the story that relates to them? What turns them into a hero? You know, what is going to be the story that allows them to navigate your universe? The second is achievement, which I think is the thing that we've been talking about the most. Achievement is about mastery. Okay? A behavioral loop giving the dopamine reward can certainly tell you that you're doing the right things, but ultimately achievement is about giving the player the opportunity to learn a skill and to then practice that skill and to be able to understand whether they're getting better or worse and to not make it so hard that they get full of anxiety and give up, nor making it so simple that it becomes trivial and they walk away. That's really the hard part of game design, or one of the hard parts of game design, is finding that balance between not making it too boring, not making it too hard. And Cheek Sent Miyahi, who is the designer who originally came up with this concept of flow, is the one who kind of has created a lot of models around that. This is the other second leg of the, of the game design stool that I think you want to be thinking about. And then cooperation. I mentioned how socialization is important to all these things. With achievement, socialization is important because being able to demonstrate a skill to someone else is important. With immersion, socialization is important because people love to share stories with each other, but also just providing inherent ways that people can achieve a goal cooperatively is so important within a game experience. And I think that 
stands for whether it's World of Warcraft, which Gabe showed, and whether it's a game where people have to actually team up and kill a boss, but it applies to everything outside of entertainment that's involved in games as well. Um, take education, for example. So education, I think, is the perennial category that's just so ripe for taking on gamification features. And unfortunately, most of the time, it's people converting a textbook to an electronic form. So I don't think it's gamification to take a textbook and put it on an iPad and then have badges that you win for reading chapters. I think it's going to be something much more creative than that. It's going to be taking the idea of an online museum and a laboratory and combining it all together into an experience where people are immersed and then have that thrill of discovery, the thrill of experience like a real scientist would almost have where they're not only learning, but they're learning together in teams, cooperating with each other. And then lastly, competition. Competition is important to human beings, not just because a lot of us like to beat other people or dominate other people, but genuinely, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's been important for us to look to who the leaders amongst us are, to understand who has mastered certain skills, to understand who exemplifies certain roles in our society so that we can try to emulate that, learn from it, and be more like them. Competition is something you can use to create those role models within a game environment. So that's the brief summary of some of the things that are important. Achievement, cooperation, competition, immersion. My name's John Radoff. I make games, I write books, I build companies. Thanks for having me this morning. John, John, everybody is looking for an edge. So can you just, you had argued that everyone's going after do the dopamine responses, <laughs> and you argued that serotonin was the, uh, an underappreciated opportunity. <laughs> of these mechanics, which two, which two or three most, most provoke serotonin responses? I assume it's, it's actually, it's cooperate. It's it's cooperation rather than achievement. But can you just comment quickly? Well, first of all, there's there's at least a hundred neurotransmitters, and we're learning more about the brain all the time. Fact is, we don't know that much about the brain as as much as we know. There's an awful lot we don't know. I don't know that serotonin is the most important either. I'm not going to present a particular neurotransmitter system that's sort of the silver bullet for how you design any system. What I do know is that in evolutionary time, cooperation, being able to collaborate with each other has been so important for um, human dominance throughout the globe and human ability to create everything from this building that we're standing in to all the companies that you guys are at. So anything that promotes people working with each other, sharing information, sharing stories, sharing their leadership, all of those things are going to contribute towards that cooperative, you know, largely mediated by serotonin, but probably much more complex than that. The short Thank you, John. <laughs> so the, so the, um, the short argument is cooperative systems will, will, is a way to get modern gamification that works better. That I think that's better. a big part of it. Well, given that our next two speakers are going to cover that, I think, you're, I think you have a good lead in. Thank Thanks. you, John.